And so we're gonna start off tonight with a song. And uh, we have a wonderful artist with us. Uh, her name is Alma Cook. And she is the co-chair of the Braver Angels Music Committee. She's a singer, songwriter, and entrepreneur who splits her time between North Dakota and California. And so she has a deep appreciation for the joys and challenges of cross-partisan, cross-cultural relationships. My favorite, uh, one of my favorite things about Alma is her, her like Twitter, like summary of herself, which is I sing, I frack. And so without further ado, Alma, I think you're going to sing a special song for us tonight. Would you tell us about it? <laughs> sure. Thanks, April. It's definitely, it's, uh, it's not about fracking. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but shout out to those of you in North Dakota. I know you know what I'm talking about. Um, I wanted to open tonight with a song that I wrote for my late friend and uh, mentor, Jackie Gerard, who was like, like a mother to me and directly inspired me toward a life of just really trying to listen to other people, including those you don't think that you have anything in common with. Jackie was chronically ill for the last few years of her life. I actually never knew a version of her that wasn't ill. But through her illness, she never stopped pursuing laughter and unity and challenging conversations with the people she loved. She took her tragedy and she not only suffered with dignity, unlike anything that I've ever seen, but she used her suffering as an excuse to be extra kind, to throw her doors extra wide, um, to bring even more people into the fold and set an even better example for the rest of the world to see. And I will never ever forget that example that she set. So this week, as it's become clearer that our mother country, Our Lady Liberty, is very ill herself. My hope is that all of us here tonight would take up that same torch of unity and hold it even higher than we did before, because our example matters. The song is called The Love. Will you put something better than wine in my blood? I'd never seen a kindness, nor had I seen a passion that would sooner hand me a house key than offer me a cup. Nobody planned for the pain we're now weary of. Still, you hold up your hand. To the name who's he now If he who thinks it's a waste Cause sees so lifted a face He'd happily give up his place And come with us to chase the love It's a dangerous trust that drove you to take us as children Expanding your temples to fit a few more inside How strange to discuss our family as though it were a mission But no more beautiful mission life ever find Nothing can match it as painfully Gracefully up from the ashes, his faithfulness comes. If he who thinks it's a waste could see so lifted a face, he'd happily give up his place and come with us to chase the love. I've seen a great light, seen you let it shine in the open. No longer will the night ever hide what's good. And I've seen a young heart feel nothing less than a bliss to be broken. There's no fear of the dark and the darkness has not understood. No, so 
rise up, come alive, and forget what you're guilty of. Cause you stand at the side of the one who's eaten up. If he who thinks it's a waste, cause see the look on your face. He'd happily humble his gaze and confront it to taste the love. Oh, something's unraveling free in a quenchable fire in me. Oh, tell me, how can there be so relentless and deep a love? Tell me, how can there be so relentless and deep a love? Mm. Thank you, Alma. That's perfect. Your music always lifts us up when we need it most. I'm so glad to see all of you here. There's a lot to say politically about what happened, but I want to speak personally for a minute first. I want to talk about trauma. We're careful with that word here at Braver Angels because it can be overused, but I want to use it now. The definition of trauma that I prefer is this, a level of stress that overwhelms the system built to handle it. When bones experience trauma, they break. That's physical trauma. And when something happens that is too much for our emotional systems, that's emotional trauma. I would say there's spiritual trauma here tonight too. I also wanna talk about anger. It's anger that comes from being ignored, from feeling that the people in charge of things are contemptuous of people like me, and don't give a damn about us. Anger is the feeling I'm hearing most, actually, from everyone in my life right now. Finally, I'd like to point out that it's not just the storming of the Capitol we're reacting to, it's also the aftermath. It seemed like there was significant unity for about five minutes on Wednesday, and then it gave way, like usual, to intense personal attacks, counterattacks, vicious barbs, and unilateral termination of relationships that fall along our usual fracture lines thanks to social media and to human folly. Last Wednesday, we saw a protest turn into a mob converging on the Capitol. They pushed their way in violently. Shocking videos have been released depicting police being struck, punched, kicked, grabbed, and beaten by members of the angry mob, including one video in which an officer is being taunted and crushed in a doorway and another in which an officer is dragged down a staircase by his helmet and beaten by the surrounding mob. Members of the mob forcibly invaded the Senate chamber, congressional offices and other spaces vandalizing as they went, with some reports of chanting for the deaths of Vice President Pence, Speaker Pelosi and others. To date, the death toll is five, including a member of the mob shot by police and an officer who was repeatedly struck in the head with a fire extinguisher and later died from those injuries. Another officer was lost to suicide in the aftermath of the violence. Let me first say that we unequivocally denounced the violent riot at the Capitol. Prior to the November election, 5,000 individuals, probably many of you here, and 400 organizations signed our Hold America Together letter in which we call for the complete disavowal of election related violence, calls for violence or excuse making for anyone on either side who would commit or tolerate violence. The time we feared when we wrote those words has come. This is not the first time we've seen political violence this year, and it's not all on one side. And God help us, there may be more to come. You can tell more than one story about what's happening, but what's undeniable is that something is broken in our country, badly, badly broken. It reminds me of when Notre Dame burned, except this time it's us, it's yours and mine, it's our country, it's our heartland. And it's worse, much worse, because it wasn't an accidental fire. It was intentional. Some folks th think that fire was a necessary burn. Others think it was arson in a sacred space, but there are shards of glass on the Senate floor and something is broken in our country. And so we mourn. In a way, all the other reactions, the fury, defensiveness, shock, emanate from the pain of what is broken. So I'm inviting us to just be with that pain for a minute and to take a moment of silence to mourn it.
I want you to be gentle with yourself tonight and realistic. Take a minute if you need to. And just remember that you are not alone. There are others in this meeting who feel the way you do. I guarantee it. You don't need to agree or to submit your principles to every word you hear tonight. You just need to want to hold America together. Let me tell you who's in the room tonight to hold America together. In the room tonight, there is a woman from Ohio who stood in line to buy a gun for four and a half hours yesterday because she's very worried we're on the brink of a civil war. She supports Trump and has real concerns about election fraud, but she doesn't want a civil war. There's a Kansas City man who was called up by the army for riot control during the 60s race riots before he was sent to Vietnam. Knowing a little bit about riot control and how easy it is for people to get killed, he is feeling blistering fury at the Capitol Police for responding so poorly to the point that he wonders if they were in cahoots with the rioters. It's my dad, by the way. There's a man from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, who was at the protest last week and is desperate to tell people that contrary to the media narrative, most of the protesters were not violent. He calls the people who stormed the Capitol building thugs, and thinks it was despicable. He wants people to know that this isn't who he is. When things turned nasty, he and others resisted, actually taking down a noose that was erected. There's a 40-year-old DC-based person of color here tonight who felt the riots viscerally. He is someone who sees nooses and knows that they're not a joke, who sees Confederate flags and has trouble talking calmly with his Republican friends. He is blindingly angry and also sad and scattered. He feels like a deep moral line has been crossed and he's questioning whether he can still reach across the aisle at all. There's a man from Ohio who loves Jesus and thinks that what happened at the Capitol was despicable, but also he wonders how many of them were Antifa. And there's a 27 year old Los Angeles man who found that even several days later, he can't process what happened, even a little bit. Usually one to read all the news and develop snappy perspectives. He's finding himself stuck in shock and trying to absorb what it means that this sort of thing may happen over and over again in his lifetime. This feels to him, not like a bottoming out, but like a dark beginning. And that's my brother. They're here because all of them and all of us want to hold America together. We want to serve. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that as a country, we want to not just do, but be something better. At tonight's meeting, you'll hear three pairs of people interviewed, one red and blue in each. We'll talk to them about how they've experienced the last week and why they stay in relationship with one another. You'll hear remarks from the Reverend Franklin Ruff, African-American leader of a deeply divided church in Stillwell, Kansas. You'll hear action steps for how you can be part of what needs to be done because Lord knows there is a lot to do. There will be some time for you to say where you are and we will finish with another beautiful song. The song by the way is really something. So I recommend staying for that if you can. I'd like to wrap up with two quotes. First, many of you know Luke Phillips, one of our brightest young conservative intellectual lights and the director of our American Political Forum series. He wrote to me Wednesday night and said that he thinks we are in our equivalent of the year 1819, the year of the first major clash between fundamentally different visions provided by the Southern and Northern states temporarily resolved by the Missouri Compromise that year. Then as now, there was a looming conflict that seemed to spring from cracks in the very foundation of our people. And then as now, the conflict was not about frivolous things, moral wrestling and ways of life were at play and the stakes were genuinely high. And Luke told me, our job for the rest of our lives will be to try to help society blend, evolve, and stay true to the virtues of her past and the values we have yet to fully embody. The issue of slavery was one over which there could ultimately be no compromise, but that is not the foundational nature of our conflicts today. Our job is to walk forward together to make sure we never get to a modern 1861. And finally, a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Many of you are probably familiar with this one. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. Let's be that light. So speaking of light, I'd like to introduce Bill Doherty who will bring to us three, red, three pairs of braver angels, one red and one blue each, who can show us some of that light in their friendship with one another. Bill? Take it away. All right. 
Thank you, April. And so we will now have um, a, a pair join me here on the screen. <clears throat> All right, welcome my friends. So we have here Carlos Hernandez. He's a red from San Francisco and a co-chair of the Braver Angels of Color Advisory Council and red co-chair of the Braver Angels San Francisco Alliance. And we also have Amania Drain who is a blue from Darien, Illinois and a leader on the Braver Angels People of Color Advisory Council. So we're starting off here, guys, at a moment of, uh, of great uh, challenge for our country. And so why don't you tell us first how you know each other? Well, we met uh, because of the Peace People of Color Advisory Council, and um, we've been teasing and joking back and forth ever since, right, Carlos? That's for sure, especially when I mispronounced your first name. <laughs> well, everybody does that, so that's okay. Yeah, yeah. So you've been uh, meeting virtually for some time <clears throat> as Braver Angels leaders. Yeah, yeah. for several months. Yeah, okay. Um, and so the first question is, uh, how have the events of the past week affected you? How have the events of the past week affected you? And Carlos, would you start? First of all, hello, America, from sea to shining sea. Uh, Three, three things that were prominent for me. First was sadness. I'm old enough to have seen what occurred on 9-11. We all saw, or most of us saw what happened on January 6th. But let's make this very real. Six, five or six families are gonna be absent their loved one. That's pretty profound. Violence is not okay. I witnessed charged emotions. Many opinions and many thoughts. I talked to a handful of my conservative friends this week. And as I try to cope with this, there was an article in this last Saturday's Wall Street Journal, a book review. The book is called The Patriots. And it reminded me that rancor is not new. Three of our founding fathers, statues that were in the Capitol building, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton and John Adams, they didn't like each other. It's in writing. They also didn't have Twitter and Facebook and social media inflame things. So we have a chance now. We're not statues. We're living bodies to do something different. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Carlos. And Amania, how have the events of this past week affected you? Uh, well, it's still pretty surreal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was kind of charged up about the Georgia election and was prepared somewhat for some type of disturbance, some possibly some violence. Um, and never in my wildest dreams would I have thought waking up Wednesday morning, um, hearing what I heard. And um, yeah, you know, I'm all these emotions of being disappointed, dismayed, um, coming out of 2020 with the things that happened with George Floyd and others, and just looking at that and thinking, um, if it had been a person of color, if it had been black people doing that, I believe it would have been very different. I would believe, I believe there would have been more dead bodies and so all these emotions continue to stay with me. And, um, but I am a person of faith, so I have hope and I love this country and uh, I'm just determined to take these emotions and, and do something. Um, yeah. So why don't you then go further and say, how can we move forward together? Uh, sure. Um, and as I said, I'm, you know, I'm a person of faith, so I believe in a God of hope. And as I think about uh, this country uh, that I love dearly, um, you know, my background is, is 
speaking out against systemic racism, thinking about, you know, those who are marginalized, those who are hurting. And, you know, if I hold true to my faith, I have to look at people in this country who feel disenfranchised, uh, disillusioned with what happened, whether I agree with it or not. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I, I heard the term through Braver Angels talking about national empathy. And, and so I say that not to say that I excuse the behavior, not that people should be held accountable because I believe anybody who is uh, convicted of any of these crimes that occurred should be held accountable uh, up to impeachment. However, that's not gonna solve our problem. So I believe moving forward, we have to find a way um, to talk to them, look at people, whether we agree with them or not, and have conversations, be willing to listen, and do that not only for the, the betterment of, uh, of my own self, but for the betterment of the country. So I, I think the, the example that Braver Angels sets uh, with listening uh, and being passionate about what you believe, but still listening is so important. Yeah, thank you. So accountability plus, that's really what you're saying. It, it, accountability won't get us out of this. It's necessary, but not sufficient for us to get out of this mess. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so Carlos, I know you've thought a lot about this as well. How, how, how can we move forward together? Well, I have common ground with Amania as a man of faith, and I am Catholic. So the very Catholic tradition in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Let's pretend we're in the confessional box. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. Notice it's not that you have sinned. It's about self-accountability, not about the other. And I believe an, in, an individual, which is a very conservative opinion, point of view, self-accountability. And that's why I love about very braver angels. We don't confess our sins. We go to workshops and we use a fancy term called inner polarizer. I was at a workshop this weekend and more than one workshop attendee said, my God, I look myself in the mirror now and I'm polarizing. I wasn't the moderator. I was the Zoom manager. I was yelling yippee yay. <laughs> we have to start with ourselves first, clean up my side of the street take my inventory and then I can deal with yours after you dealt with it. That's how I believe we can move forward in the context of braver angels. That's my answer. Uh, Amini, I saw you smiling and nodding as he talked. Do you want to add anything? Uh, you know, it, still, I'm just feeling the, the emotions, um, but I, I love what Carlos said. Um, Start with self, you know, and um, do some work there. Uh, sometimes, you know, being slow to anger uh, is definitely a good thing because if you can't get through that anger to get results, um, you know, even, you know, we look at the division sometimes within our families. We still love our family, even though we disagree with them. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the disagreement is okay. I think it's healthy but be willing to listen. And uh, I, I love Carlos uh, starting with self, yeah. I'm a words, Carlos. How do we get through this? I love what Peter Bell says. He's a conservative. Peter Bell on a recent podcast said, I don't have the answers, but I have a lot of questions. So come with your questions and hear the other and hear the other. You know, Bill, Thank you, Bill. Yeah. if I could just jump in and say this, because I, I'm really pleased with it. Last night, um, about 13, 14 of us got together, uh, about half Republican and half Democrat uh, in the state of Illinois. So we just started a, an alliance mm -hmm. and for, you know, my brothers and sisters who disagree with me politically. Uh, there is a lot of common ground and more than anything last night with our alliance, we were just, you know, it, it was just so positive, so encouraging. I learned a lot. Um, and so I, I wish more of us could, could do that, 
be willing to talk to people who you may disagree with on certain issues politically. Um, those, I consider them all my friends. And you did it this week. Last night. <laughs> Last night. Last you, did time. Not, you did not call it off. No, no. I, I got an email from a colleague saying, gee, is this, this Brave Angels workshop Saturday going to be called off? And I said, no. <laughs> this is what we need to do more. So thank you both for, for starting you're up. Welcome. Uh, it's, it, you're both, you both wore my heart. So thank you. And so now we'll go to our second red blue pair. And there is Kuyar and Greg. All right, gentlemen. So Greg Smith is a red and Kuyar Mustafi is a blue and they are founding co-chairs of the first ever Braver Angels Alliance in Southwest Ohio. And um, a number of you may recognize them as stars of the Braver Angels documentary. Brave Angels Reuniting America. And so let's start with just how you guys know each other because it's been a while since you, you knew each other. Uh, and uh, Kuyar, tell us about you and Greg. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Greg and I met at the very, I would say the second ever Better Angels or Braver Angels, I should say, workshop, which was conducted in early 2017, right after the election of, uh, uh, Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And the goal of the workshop was to invite, uh, you know, about seven or eight people that voted for uh, Hillary and seven or eight who voted for Donald Trump to spend a weekend together and learn about each other's side and point of view and see if they can find any common ground or commonality uh, between themselves. And Greg and I were partners in that workshop and we uh, went through a lot of exercises together and we at the at the course of the event of course became friends and learned about each other's faith and heritage and uh, we became friends from from that moment on and we decided to actively participate in you know depolarizing America and forming the the Southwest Ohio Alliance and the rest is uh, four years of uh, depolarization yeah so Greg, say something about your relationship with Kuyar. Well, the first thing I want to know, Bill, is how did uh, Kuyar get my halo? I want it back. <laughs> and as all my uh, Braver Angel uh, friends know, especially since the first convention, uh, I do bring the humor to this group, I think, a lot of times. But let me tell you something. It's been a fantastic four years of, of hanging out with Kuyar. We, we, we get together a lot. The COVID thing has slowed things down, but... Um, we've done a lot of speaking engagements together. As he said, we met there uh, and, and, and he went to my church and he watched how we worship uh, Jesus. And, uh, and then I, uh, as, a, as a return favor, I went back and, and uh, went to his mosque. It was very educational for me. We got to learn each other and, and how we, uh, you know, uh, his, his, you know, the first thing that he said to me when I asked him about ISIS ISIS, ISIS, and he says, stop right there. My, my religion has been hijacked. And um, to this day, I told him too, I said, you know, it, it's the same with mine. I said, mine is or has been and is being hijacked as well. So, um, you know, we pray together. Uh, and a lot of people don't understand it, but there is but one God. And so when we pray, we're praying to one God. Um, God will sort it out when we get there, okay? And that's how I see it. But it's been a fantastic four years of, of having Kuyar as a friend. Um, I say, what is it? I, I tell him he's the mad Iranian. I'm the crazy Christian. And it works. It's a good blend. God <laughs> fixes it and it works. And, and we just, uh, I love Kuyar. And he's got your halo. He's got your Christian halo. I love halo. So God be nice and decent until <laughs> I get it back. There we go. Okay. <laughs> um, so... I'd like to ask each of you, uh, and if you could go first, uh, Greg, how have the events of the past week affected you? It's been really rough. Um, several things about it. Um, first of all, there's loss of life and um, my years of being a police officer uh, fresh out of high school. Um, 
I dealt with that uh, more than I ever wanted to, but uh, I started learning then that uh, there's no control over it, that it's gonna happen. But it, it still doesn't keep me from being sad when there's loss of life, no matter what the situation is. Um, to that, uh, to lose fellow officers in, um, in a tragedy is, is horrendous. I can't stand it. Uh, and then the one that uh, nobody's mentioned yet is how in the world, I don't, I don't, under, I can't fathom how a military person, uh, an Air Force veteran that has been, and, and, and supposedly a Trump supporter um, could get dragged into that too. So we lost a, a, a very part of our nation's soul in a veteran and police officers and then citizens. And I don't care if they're on the left or the right, you know, um, loss of life is loss of life. Those lives are lives that um, if I had anything to do it, I'd try to make sure that, uh, that they had their, light, their, right, their life right with the Lord before that happened. But again, we'll leave that to the ultimate judge. But it's, it's been, it's taken a toll on me and, and I, I just hate it. I hate that it happened and I'm all for trying to figure a way to, to keep it from happening anymore. Uh, Kuyar, how, for you, the last week. Uh, I mean, just like Greg mentioned, the, the, the loss of life and you know, the, the tragic events within itself has been very unfortunate and sad. Um, but then at the same time, in, the, in a, another angle, I'm wondering how as a nation we are supposed to move on from, you know, from the election and from this incident. You know, we, we have two camps that are extremely emotional and especially the, the right, the conservatives that have lost the election, they, they have all this passion and emotion and anger that, and at the same time, they, my worry is that they may, or, or certain faction within them may take the matter into their own hand and, you know, try to enforce the, the you know, the law or, you know, take things the way they see that should fit and react in a way that we unfortunately see events and tragedies for, for many years to come. And uh, that, that is really the, the thing that keeps me up at night, you know, every night, you know, ever since the election, I, I've been grappling with this question that, you know, as a country, how are we supposed to move on from this animosity? Because, you know, uh, elections and politics should not be a blood sport. It should not be a team sport. You know, one side wins, one side loses, and then we should come together and, you know, build this country together. So I've been just wrestling with the question of how we should move, move forward and how we can calm ourselves to be rational in moments like this. Yeah, so let me turn to that question to you, Greg. How, how do we move forward? Well, uh, we move forward and, you, and my brave angel uh, colleagues, they know what to expect from me. And that is we have to look to God for this. Um, we can't wrap our heads around things that happen. Uh, we can't understand what, why things happen. And when that happens to me, and, and I think I invite the rest of the country to do this, you have to just trust in the Lord that there's a reason for everything. Um, no matter who gets president, no matter who's in charge here uh, in the near future. Our God will reign. We have to look to him. Our God has given us, uh, especially I'm speaking now to the conservatives, my Republican friends, my, and, and everyone for that matter, but um, there's a black cloud for us right now. And for the last four years, we have been saying, why do they act like that? Why do they behave like that? Talking about the blue and, and the and the riots and the, and the disturbances and the buildings burning and all that stuff. And, and then on this day, and the facts aren't in yet, all the facts aren't in yet, I'm waiting for that before I can make any specific judgment on, on what I really think happened there. But um, we, have to, uh, we have to be self, you know, hold ourselves accountable. And what we have an opportunity to do now is to be the example and show that we can be a good loser, okay? It, 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 did, it did not go our way, 
but we're not going to behave erratically. We're not going to do these things. We're going to trust that God's going to come down. We're going to pray for our, our, um, the other administration. We're going to pray for Biden. We're going to pray. I'm going to pray that, that, that the Lord touches their hearts and that, um, that we just get this all together. And we have to be a light. Uh, and like April said, we have to be a light. Remember in the first convention, that was my uh, departing uh, words that I gave to, the, uh, to my colleagues. And that's what I told them. I had that little light prop and I turned that light switch on. I said, put this light in your heart, turn it on and leave it on. And that I fail God daily, but he never fails me. So what we have to do is be the light, turn the light on in your heart and, and I'm talking to myself, <laughs> Kuyar busted me just last week on a Facebook post. And I had to take it down because I, I fail God daily. I fail myself daily, okay? But God will never fail us. And you know what to expect from me. And uh, just go to God in prayer, be a light, and let's work together. And let's, let's get this all, you know, we're not Trump and done, okay? There's, there's, more, there's more people coming. Right now, we have to look to the other administration. We have to pray that they lead us in the right direction, pray that they get their wisdom from the same God that we pray to, okay? So that's how I feel about it. That's how we move on is we be the uh, self-accountability. It's already been said, but yeah. be the light and move on. Okay, thank you. And uh, we just have a couple minutes uh, left. With Kuyar. Um, how do we move forward? Um, you know, just like... Uh, Greg mentioned, you know, we, we move on by, you know, having a, a, a respectful and civil conversation among our citizens. You know, we, we right now, everybody's looking at the Capitol, they're looking at the president, they're looking at the Congress, you know, for impeachment or, you know, different strategies. I would say that should not be our first and foremost concern as citizens. As citizens, we should deal with each other in our neighborhood, in our communities, and reach out and start listening to each other and, and bring that civility and respect back. Because you know, we tend to you know, stereotype the other side as their most extreme factions. And you know, if I don't talk to my, fellow, my, you know, my conservative uh, people, uh, I will never know what goes on in their heart. And I may stereotype all of them as, you know, people that are constantly angry and don't want to do anything to do with me or, or with the civility. And, you know, just a conversation with Greg that I had calmed me in a sense that I know there are people of goodwill on both sides that, you know, don't want to take the matters into the extreme and are willing to work. I mean, I don't know, working together at this point may be a bonus, but to just kind of calm down and you know let the events play themselves out, let the new administration comes and you know get to the business of the country. So just, I guess, having a respectful conversation and ongoing conversation with people that we disagree with should be what I would recommend. Well, and you too have, uh, you began in a conversation and you've sustained it and you've sustained a relationship and uh, folks may not know uh, how much you differ politically. <laughs> I mean, you're very different politically. Um, and you have sustained the relationship, including being able to challenge each other and not just be, you know, kumbaya. Um, and so um, I appreciate your, your willingness to talk with us here. And I know you're going to move ahead together and in your community. So thank you for right. your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And so we will now move to our third pair, who are both uh, folks involved in public office. So that's the representative King Phillips on the, on the screen so far. Good evening, everybody. It looks it looks like you're in a vehicle. I am off to fulfill my responsibilities and vote. And I'm so sorry I'm doing it from the car, but I hey. trust you all understand. I, I was not going to miss this, no okay. matter what. Well, thank you. We're uh, car or no car. We're, we're happy to have you here. Uh, and so, and then we have, so what we have here, folks, is um, um, we have Re Representative Dean Phillips, who is a Democratic member of Congress from Minnesota uh, and a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus. And we have uh, Gary Herbert, a Republican who just finished two terms as the governor of Utah. So just finished, right? The governor just well actually uh 
12 years. So yeah. Oh, 12 years. Okay. So 12 years. Okay. He's been the longest serving governor in America. Oh, all right. All right. Well, we're, we're happy to have both of you here tonight. Uh, and you don't know each other, I assume. I don't think we've met. Yeah. No, we don't. But I, but Governor, I'm a big fan. You're the longest serving governor. I'm one of the shortest serving Congress members. So <laughs> it's a good, we're, we're a good combination already. But you both had to, you both had to get reelected because you got reelected, uh, Dean. So there, there we have it. Um, <laughs> but I think you will discover some things you have in common here, uh, gentlemen. So uh, you've heard the you've heard the others uh, uh, talk, uh, be interviewed, and so the 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 first question is, how have the events of the past week affected you? And I'd like to start with you, uh, Congressman uh, Phillips. Well, Bill, I want to first. I want to thank you for what you've put together and to all of you on this call tonight. Now, you're not just the braver angels, you are the bravest angels and the ones that our country needs um, so much right now. So I wanna thank you. You know, the past week has changed all of us. Uh, there's no question. Um, I was on the house floor uh, when the insurrection began uh, with colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, during the first meetings. And I'll tell you about three very distinct feelings I had that night, Bill. The first of which was anger. Uh, there's no question at the very moment that we were told to take cover, put on our gas masks, we heard a pounding at the door. Um, you know, we knew that at, the, at that time, one of the best case scenarios was that we would be taken hostage. God knows what would have been worse. Um, my second reaction was fear, fear for our country. I couldn't disbelief that this could be happening uh, in the United States. You know, I, I also want to share something very personal and poignant and something left an indelible mark on me, which was I at that very moment encouraged my Democratic colleagues sitting with me on the Democratic side of the House chamber to run with me to the Republican side because we had uh, reasons to believe that those who had penetrated the Capitol were coming for Democrats. And as we did so, I realized very, very distinctly that many of my colleagues could join me in changing the side of the floor that we were on, but they couldn't change their skin color when it came to what was forthcoming. And I, I share that with all of you because we have those moments in our life that stay with us and you never know when they're going to happen and it happened for me at that moment. But I got to tell you the most important that's where it dovetails with what we're talking about tonight, which is no matter what had occurred, you know, on that moment, we were all Americans. It wasn't Democrats, or Republicans anymore. If blood had spilled, it all would have been red. If we had died the next morning, the sky would have been blue. And uh, that's what sticks with me. And I want to recognize tonight that we all have to take a step back uh, before we take a big giant leap forward. And that is my prerogative. And I'm grateful for the governor for being here and to all of you. But I also have to say this, and you all know it. I'm preaching to the converted right now. Uh, you are the better angels. You are the ones. We are the ones uh, that are working together, recognize our priorities. We need to extend invitations and have conversations with people right now who are not open to that idea. And that is what has changed me. And that's going to be my life mission moving forward. Well, thank you, uh, Congressman. That's very, very moving. You were right in the middle of all that. I appreciate your sharing that and sharing your, your, your fear uh, and uh, and your learnings, your learnings from what happened there. Um, so, uh, uh, Governor, um, how would you answer the question of, of uh, how the events of the past week affected you? Uh, well, Bill, first, let me say I'm honored to be with all of you today, and I appreciate the good words of the congressman and others who have spoken. Um, I come from a perspective of a governor of a state who has a lot of friends throughout the country. I'm the past chairman of the National Governors Association and also the Western Governors, Associ uh, Western Governors Association, as well as the president of the Council of State Governments, working with a lot of legislators. So I have friends on both sides of the aisle, different philosophies that are all we're angry, disappointed. Uh, it doesn't comprehend, it doesn't compute. People who claim to be patriots and yet seditionary acts as we storm the Capitol, our sacred edifice that represents our democratic republic to the world. So for me, it was a, a, a time of just a complete non able to comprehend and compute the activities of the day and could not understand the motivation. Um, again, I've learned more in sense as we've are sorting through the facts and, and I certainly don't want to overgeneralize because I think that there are good honorable people that were there protesting. 
Uh, and and as, like a lot of things in life, a few spoil it for the many. But those people who went to Capitol Hill and conducted themselves uh, makes me angry. It makes me disappointed. I'm discouraged uh, about the whole conflict out there. And um, frankly, I, 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 I guess if I ask myself, are you surprised? And if I was going to be honest about it, I guess I'm not as surprised as I should be. We've had so much divisiveness over the last decade. It's not just this administration either, by the way, although they may have put more kerosene on the fire. Um, but we've had divisiveness and it goes back to our cable television views. We're siloed. Uh, we don't uh, discuss things. There's no such thing as dialogue. There's my way and that's the right way. It's the correct way. Your way is the wrong way. Uh, Republicans go to Fox News. Democrats go to MSNBC. We get siloed and we become so divisive. Our campaigns uh, and Utah is a pretty tame state compared to what I see around the country, but we spend, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars tearing down the opposition, not promoting ourselves, but tearing down the opposition. And so this fomenting of anger and divisiveness has led to this, uh, I think, a divisiveness that really has exploded this past week with this uh, onslaught on the Capitol. So maybe we shouldn't be as surprised as we think. That being the case, the question really is, what do we do going forward? Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you, and that's um, that's what we need to be thinking about. And and we're uh, I want to before I ask each of you to say how we can move forward, I want to note that you you both have built careers around being bipartisan, um, and that's one of the reasons why we're so glad to have both of you here. Um, and so, um, uh, Representative Phillips. Um, how would you begin our conversation about how we how we move forward? So, Dean, I don't know. I know you're in that. It, it, it's an amazing, amazing picture here, and in in the okay, in, in the I'm back with you. No, no, it's 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 an amazing thing. We if we if we had orchestrated this, we couldn't have done it better. Okay. No, well, hey, yeah, welcome. This is your this is all this is your house, everybody. Yeah, this is our house. Um, and so um, to start us off, um, uh, uh, Congressman, how do we move forward? You know, I, I got to say, Bill, I, I think it was Steve Hartman from CBS the other day who said the soul of America cannot be ransacked. And the solution to what ails us isn't under a dome. And that dome he's talking about is the one right there behind me. And we can't legislate compassion, we can't legislate love, we can't legislate understanding or listening or decency. You know, that comes from all of us in our hearts, uh, followed by our heads. And my, my advice, my invitation is that we start extending invitations, uh, doing what you're doing, doing what all of you, I think 4,000 or so on this call are doing tonight, uh, which is to recognize there's something so much more important than our politics, and that's the preservation of our republic, um, our communities, and even our lives. And this is the first week of my entire life where I felt that my life was threatened. Next week it will be as well. And I'm sharing that with my brothers and sisters on both sides of the aisle. And I just wanna express gratitude, most importantly, because I think as, to answer your question, Bill, the real answer here is gratitude. Mm -hmm. And as one who stayed in Washington after the horrors of this week, um, I walked the halls of the Capitol every day since I've been in town, since last Wednesday, just to thank people, to thank the officers that were heroic, to thank the Capitol staff whose names you'll never know and jobs um, are just as important as mine, um, our staffs, my fellow members, and there's something remarkable uh, that happens when you express gratitude uh, and that humility that goes with it. Uh, and that's how we experience repair and rehabilitation. And um, I think it's time that our country collectively start expressing a little more gratitude for what we have because it's precious, it's fragile, and it's in our hands. So with that, I say Godspeed uh, and gratitude to all of you because I love you all, no matter your politics, no matter how you eat, how you pray, the color of your skin, uh, I love you all. And um, can't wait to see more of you and uh, get to work together. That's, that's really quite beautiful. Would you, would you mind telling us um, 
maybe a little story about somebody you expressed gratitude to and what their response was this week? Yeah, you know, I tell you, one of the most poignant moments I've had, Bill, in the past, um, gosh, in a long time was the night of the horrors. Um, as you all know, we spent, um, after we escaped the chamber, we spent about seven hours in a safe room together, Democrats and Republicans, which was powerful itself. Uh, we were determined to not let these insurgents and the siege interrupt our constitutional duty to affirm this election. Uh, we were resolved to get back to the floor, which we did late that night, as you all know, I think at 3.42 in the morning is when we, all, when we finally got the work done. Uh, sometime around 1 a.m., my colleague Tom Malinowski and I left the House chamber just to take a walk through the Capitol. It was dark outside. It was now quiet. You'd never know what had just transpired hours before, uh, bloodshed and rampage and siege. And we walked through the most beautiful room in America, which I think is the U.S. Rotunda here at the Capitol. And it was quiet. And we saw a guy on his hands and knees with a garbage bag uh, picking up the remnants of, of, of the siege, Garb tons of garbage, plastic bottles and bulletproof vests and sticks and clubs and all kinds of things. And lo and behold, it was our colleague, Representative Andy Kim from New Jersey. And he had tears in his eyes when he told us that he couldn't stand the sight of seeing our rotunda, every one of our rotunda, um, so defaced and that he wasn't going to rest and quit until he picked up every last piece of garbage on the floor. And it's that spirit, um, you know, when I, you know, we may be members of Congress, but we're more importantly custodians. And literally Andy Kim that night was the custodian for all of us. And that's the spirit we need. Um, and that's, that's one little story I wanna share because in all the darkness, you can always find light if you look hard enough. And that's why Braver Angels is gonna illuminate the way for all of us. So I love you all and I'm grateful. Thank you, Congressman. So governor, how do we move forward? Well, I think there's a variety of things we need to do. Uh, one of the things we need to probably recognize is I'm not sure everybody wants to move forward. There are some people that like the divisiveness. Uh, it, maybe it gives them more authority, power, they believe. Uh, it's a short-term goal, uh, maybe with long-term consequences. But I would hope and I believe that the vast majority do want to do better and be better. But there are some out there that are going to be a protagonist on our efforts to try to reconcile and come together. Uh, I had a fellow today tell me he thinks we're closer to civil war than we are to reconciliation. Uh -huh. Now with these constant bits of divisiveness and anger that's uh, fomenting out there, I can understand his opinion. I, I think we need to do a better job of communication. I mentioned earlier, you know, we kind of get siloed. Uh, we don't listen. I think we need to seek first to understand and then to be understood, uh, we sometimes don't, uh, we do it in reverse order as I am adamant about my uh, point of view, I'm dogmatic about my position and uh, I'm right and you must be wrong then. So we, I think we need to do a lot better job of communication. I think tone matters and, and, and we ought to be uh, moderate in tone. I, we can be proud conservatives, proud liberals, however you want to label yourself but as I've told the governors when we come together as the National Governors Association, let's take the label off of our forehead that says Republican, uh, Democrat, conservative, liberal, and put common sense there in place and, and see if we can't, in fact, bring some common sense and a practical aspect of what we're trying to do. And that means finding the common good, actually compromising. Ooh, that would be a scary thing to do in the in the in the in the method of our founding fathers. They compromised a lot and gave us a great document, our constitution. So I think communication is important, uh, moderation and tone and inclusiveness in process. Uh, I'm happy to sit down with anybody. They can be diametrically opposed to my policy position, but maybe I can learn and modify and improve. I remember talking to President Obama about uh, the Affordable Care Act. And, and the divisiveness that's created in our country. And I said, Republicans want to, in fact, repeal and replace. And, and, and President Obama says, well, I think we can improve the Affordable Care Act. So I said, you want to modify and improve. You know, when you think about that, modify, improve, repeal and replace with what? Those can come pretty close together. 
-hmm. If we had leadership willing to, in fact, let's see if we can't come together on these concepts and principles and come together with, uh, with a something that we can all feel good about and compromise our position and get something better for the whole. So I, I think we can do a better job of that. Um, I'll just conclude by saying I, I've heard a lot of talk uh, about faith and, and I'm encouraged because of the comments been made. And uh, I, I too am a man of faith. And I think there's an eternal principle for all of us, no matter what our denomination may be, but we are all children of God, which means we're all brothers and sisters. We're all part of one race. It's called the human race. And consequently, we ought to, as Amonius said, you know, we have, we're of the same family. We're brothers and sisters. We may have disagreement, but we should love each other and help each other. Where can I, what can I do to make your life better? as we work together for the common good. So I, I would add to that, that uh, faith without works is dead. James taught us that in the New Testament. Again, a principle that we all understand we need to roll up our sleeves and go to work. My father had a saying that's kind of the Herbert family slogan. He's raised on a farm up in Idaho. He's the hardest working fellow I ever knew. And the family slogan he got from his grandfather which he used in our family, which I use in my family now. I'm a, I am a husband and father, uh, now married 50 years. I have uh, six children, three boys and three girls. I kept the balance of power even, and 70 grandchildren. That's my primary duty, is to make sure life is good for them and, and to do my part in making the family stable, which is the foundation of our society. But he taught us this thing. We call it the eight W's. Work will win. When wishy-washy wishing won't. <laughs> we all wish things were better. We all wish things were different or better or however we look at our life and, and, and we wish about it. But as dad would say, work will win when wishy-washy wishing won't. We have work to do. And I appreciate the fact that the congressman talked about gratitude. My kids come to me and I'm a little older. I'm 73 years of age. And they tell, say, dad or grandpa, tell us about the good old days. Well, guess what, kids? These are the good old days today. In spite of the pandemic and the challenge that's presented for us, in spite of the events of this past week, we're living in the best time in the history of the world. Now look what we're doing. We're talking to each other around the country. 5,000 people listening in from different countries and all the states. We're communicating. We're learning. We're dialoguing. We're going to be a better person tomorrow because of being on this meeting today because of technology. We're living longer, healthier lives. Governor, in terms of our time together, I have to move us along. Okay, so well, I'm going to just, say a final word, and then I'll ask it, uh, Rick, Congressman Phillips if you want to say a final word. I'm just saying we live in a great time. We have a responsibility to roll up our sleeves and go to work. We can do better and be better and express gratitude along the way. And if we love our brothers and sisters like we should as children of God and eternal principle, we will change our conduct and we'll do better. Thank you, Governor. Here, here. Yes, so uh, Representative Phillips, final word. Well, just a gratitude again. You know, what I failed to mention and I think is perhaps the most important uh, strategy for moving forward is to, you know, they say God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason, that is to, to listen more. And uh, tactically, if we're really going to take steps uh, in a unified way um, uh, to become the country that I know we can and will, it's gonna start with opening our ears as much as our hearts, um, starting with our ears. And, and that means me, it means all of you, it means my colleagues in this institution, and particularly the most angry people in the country right now, uh, both on the left and the right. Um, this is happening for a reason, and it's because people don't feel heard. Um, and blame can be cast in all directions on all of us, um, but the antidote is clear, and it is to open our ears uh, and then our hearts. And um, you are leading us and illuminating that path forward, and I bless you all, and I can't thank you enough. So let's do this again and um, more often and with more of us. Thanks, everybody. Well, and thanks to both of you. Uh, my, my heart is full listening to you. And after our citizen red blue pairs to have our political leaders who I know are, you know, are walking the talk. I know both of you have uh, have done that and are doing that. So we're very grateful to both of you. And Thank now you, everybody. back to April.
All right. Thank you so much to all of our pairs. Um, I just loved them. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I find this so, so refreshing. Um, we're going to move now to another uh, bit of medicine for our troubled souls from the Reverend Franklin Ruff. Uh, Reverend Franklin Ruff is, a, is pastor of First Baptist Church in Stillwell, Kansas. Very happy to have another Kansan here and is the red co-chair of the recently formed Braver Angels Kansas City Alliance. Reverend, what would you like to tell us? Well, thank you, April. A lot of people have been talking tonight about light. And I think that Braver Angels is a light in our country right now. And I am grateful uh, that I found them. I, I'm relatively new here. I found uh, Braver Angels back in September, but I have been doing work of trying to depolarize people for years. And at times it can seem really lonely, but finding Braver Angels showed me that, well, no, it's, it's not that lonely. And I believe that Braver Angels is an organization that is needed at such a time as this. I love my country. And I look back on January 6th and I saw the very image of our nation stormed. And I, I was angry. I, I saw the Capitol in a haze because of tear gas. And I'm, I was saying to myself, this doesn't make any sense. Th this should not be happening. We should be better than this. This is what we profess in our, in our founding documents. And then I began to think about the aftermath and how it was going to look for some of my friends and maybe even for myself. You see, I, when I talk about my political leanings, I call myself a pragmatic, right-leaning moderate. In political language, people will say I'm a conservative. And in Brave Angels language, I'm a red. And what I saw, what, what, what I was thinking is that there are gonna be those that are going to attempt to make excuses for what's happening here. There are gonna be those that are going to attempt to downplay it on one side and on the other side, there are going to be those that are going to take all of us that have a similar political ideology and, and say that all of us are like those individuals who stormed the Capitol. And of course, there was that moment in which I thought maybe I'm wrong because I saw my elected representatives come together as one and, and do their constitutional duty. And then the sun came up. I got a call from one of my friends who is a deep blue friend of mine. And we were talking about the events that had taken place. And he says to me, he says, well, what do you expect when you have an ideology and a party that is full of racist, misogynist, xenophobes, homophobes, and transphobes? And I said, um, is that how you think of me? And he said, no, you're one of the few good ones. I asked him, should I be offended by that? And he said, of course you shouldn't be offended because it's the truth and the truth shouldn't offend you. So then I asked him, I said, well, let's change the conversation. Let's say we're talking about black men. And you say to me, well, you know, black men, they're criminals. They're thugs, they're lazy, but not you. You're one of the few good ones. Should I be offended then? And he said, well, of course, because that's not true. And I said, yes, you're right, that's not true. And guess what? The vision that you have of my friends, the vision that you have of the people who have an ideology similar to mine, that's not true either. We all want mostly the same things. We want to take different paths. And yes, we have some really big differences, but we can come together and we can overcome them. Now, of course, I have the added uh, issue of being a pragmatic, right-leaning, 
moderate who is also black. So there's those additional uh, name callings that take place such as sellout or race trader. But guess what? I also know that the people who are doing that don't represent the majority of blues. They don't represent the majority of the people who have a ideology that is different and sometimes slightly, sometimes greatly different from my own. And so I'm not going to put them all into that one box. I'm also a pastor. And as a Christian pastor who's been called to this church, I'm called to pastor, to teach, and to love my entire congregation, not just the reds and not just the blues. And so this work, sometimes it can be hard, it, can, it takes long, it can be stressful, and it can be exhausting. And if I'm honest with you right now, I'm kind of exhausted. But the work needs to be done. And with me, it comes down to two things, humanity and humility. When I look at even those individuals that are, are saying nasty things and calling names, I need to see their humanity. I need to understand that, yes, they're American citizens too. They're angry. What are they angry about? Maybe I need to find out. And as a Christian, I also need to look at them and see someone that is made in the image of God. And then there's humility. You see, I have a worldview. I have politics, I have an ideology, but I'm also a human being and I'm imperfect, which means I'm wrong about some things. I don't know what they are, but I am wrong about some things. And guess what? My blue friends, they're right about some things. And I have to at least attempt to have the humility to understand that, to see their humanity and have the humility to know I'm not, I don't have all the answers. I'm not right about everything. Now, some people might ask, they say, well, you, you say it's hard work, you say it's long, you say it's tiring, why do it? Well, the answer for all of us is going to be different. I do it because I think it's my responsibility. It's my responsibility to, to try and depolarize as a citizen. It's my responsibility as a pastor. It's my responsibility as a husband. It's my responsibility as a father. Because the country, the America that I was born into, is better than the America my mother was born into. And the America she was born into is better than the America my grandparents were born into. And the America that my three boys live in, I want to leave better than the America that I was born into. So it's my responsibility to do the work. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's tiring. But I have a responsibility to do it. Our Constitution starts with the words, we the people of these United States in order to form a more perfect union. It says, we the people, we the people, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, we the people, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, atheist, we the people, blue and red. It's going to take an organization like it's going to take us, those of us who are braver angels to shine that light and to be the we the people that comes together to depolarize and to help to, to make that more perfect union so that I can leave a better country for my children and for my grandchildren than I had. And don't get me wrong, I feel that I came into a pretty darn good country, but it's not perfect and we can make it better. And I think one of the first things that we can do to make it better is to look and see the humanities of others and to be humble. No, we don't have all the answers. So one of the things that I want to do is I want to say to our incoming administration, to President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris, I want to wish them the best. Because if they do well, if they succeed, if that administration succeeds, we all succeed. I want to look at the incoming Congress and say, good luck and I hope you do well. Because if they do well, we all do well. 
And I want to just encourage all of us to see the humanity in those that are different from us and to have a little bit of humility in knowing that we don't have all the answers. And I think if we do that, we can take a few steps towards making that more perfect union for our children and their children. Thank you much. April. Thank you, Reverend. Thank you so much for being here. Wow, my goodness. So now we will shift to what can we do? I know that uh, that's actually in some ways what we're all here for, right? Is to figure out how do we act in support of what we are saying here tonight. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to our president, David Blankenhorn. But first I'm gonna give you just uh, a little, one more sort of tech housekeeping note. And that is about the Q&A box. I imagine that some of you are here for the first time and others haven't used the Q&A box before. So I'm just gonna explain how to use it. So David and Julie Bowler are going to tell us about the action steps that we uh, invite you into. And then you will have a chance to ask questions. And the way that we do that is in this Zoom format, we use a Q&A box. And so you can find that by going to the bottom of your screen and scrolling over. Uh, so you, if you start at the mute button, just keep going. And eventually you'll find a little box that says Q&A. You can click on that and you can enter any questions that you have about the action steps. So, uh, and, and a thing to know is that you should ask them as they come to mind. Don't wait till the end because we'll be sorting as we go. We have a number of excellent volunteers who are helping tonight to pick out some questions uh, that will be asked verbally. Uh, we'll do the best we can to answer other questions in the chat itself. Uh, although with over 4,000 people here, we can't promise to do all of them. We'll do our best. And uh, if your question is selected to be one of those that's uh, asked verbally, um, you'll get a message saying that, and then uh, I'll call on you at a certain time. So uh, that's what it is and where it is. I'd like to also just say what it's for. Um, so we turned off the chat and, and the Q&A box is for questions. It's not for chatting. Um, and sometimes people say somewhat unpleasant things there. Please don't make us remove you. Uh, we will if we have to, but keep this to um, questions about action steps and then to answer the checkout question, which is coming next. Finally, if you have a technical question or something like that, go ahead and check the answered questions, which you can also find in the Q&A box in the, the middle tab of it. And if you have questions about the Q&A box, you can ask them in the Q&A box, ha ha ha. All right, everybody. Uh, David Blankenhorn, please uh, come on to our, our virtual stage and tell us what can we do? Hey, April. Uh, wow, I, I am so happy to be with you all tonight. Uh, I can't think of any place else I'd rather be. Um, the message that we got from the people who uh, spoke was so, so clear um, that, you know, our country needs us. Our country needs us and we need each other. Um, you know, despite all the disagreement and the conflict and the anger and the frustration and in some ways because of those things because of those differences um our country needs us to be herself to be america and we need each other and of course as so many of the wonderful people who spoke tonight said we need each other not just in some passive way of, of consuming information together although that can be good we we need, we need each other in an active way of standing together, um, of, uh, yes, acting together. And I think if we do act together, uh, we, we, will, we will serve and we may even save our country. And uh, to tell us concretely how everyone in this meeting, the thousands of us on this meeting can do that, start doing that tonight not tonight, uh, in a, some couple of very concrete ways. I want to uh, ask my Brave Angels colleague, uh, Julie Bowler, to just take a moment to walk us through that. Julie. Thank you, David. And don't you ever put me following the Reverend Franklin Ruff. 
again. <laughs> it's a promise. It's a promise. I'm still reacting to that. Thank you so much, Franklin. I'm going to use this recording and go listen to that again when I need it. Um, so hello, everybody. I am very inspired by the number of people that turned out. Um, you've had a taste, a little taste now of what Braver Angels is about, but I can promise you that in one meeting, um, it, it is just scratching the surface. And in order to start plowing forward, you have to decide that's what you want to do. And my argument is that to decide if that's what you want to do, you need to go ahead and plow forward because there's a lot of different experiences um, that you can have with Braver Angels. Um, so we kind of lined them up in three categories. Um, you can do one, two, or all three. Um, if you go to the homepage, braverangels.org, and I believe that's being sent out in your chat right now. When you land on the homepage, you're going to see three big buttons, join, experience, and act. And I'll just say a little about all three. <clears throat> um, we with join, we just really warmly, enthusiastically invite you to join Braver Angels. It is $12 a year. And what that does is it just puts you in a pipeline to get all of our news and announcements. You get invited to some national events like public forums and our unique um, Not Your Father's Debate debate, which is Braver Angels. Um, special creation um, and book discussions. Um, you also get access to uh, member meetings and to a member portal, which is chock full of materials and resources that you can use to start doing some organizing in your own area. Um, you can find out how to join a Braver Angels Alliance, um, how to start an alliance if there's not one in your area. And, um, you know, just, we want you to feel connected. We want you to feel whether you're ready to do any kind of um, outreach or spreading the word, um, we want you to feel like you have some fodder for your thoughts about all this work. So please join. Um, the next button you'll come to on the homepage is experience. And if you click on that, you're going to go to a place where you can sign up for Braver's Angel, Braver Angels events um, right away. Um, you can scroll through and see that there are national events and local events. The local part comes into play more when hopefully soon we can get back to face-to-face -face gatherings, but the national events are there. And, um, you know, like I said, you got a little taste of what we're about on this um, call, but if you dig into the debates and the workshops, you're really going to experience it yourself, not just sit and watch it, but be a part of it. And it's very challenging, um, but I think it's very rewarding. Um, so we really just urge you to click on the experience box. And uh, I guess the, the last thing I would say is that that is, um, if you're searching for the answer to the question of whether there's even, if this is a time to work on reconciliation. Um, and, and that's a question that's come up for all of us at Braver Angels in the last week. Um, just, you know, do we keep close with our own tribes and just um, focus on what we believe is right and leave reconciliation for another day? Um, or do we believe that you can simultaneously advocate for the side that represents your point of view um, and build skills of your own um, to figure out how to start treating people that you differ with, um, with humanity? And um, my, my call on that is that, that doing it simultaneously is possible and that it's our only hope. Um, and you'll find in doing some of these experiences that, you know, slowly but surely you see how possible it is to do that in the programming that we have. Um, the last thing that you'll come to or you'll see on the homepage is the ACT button. Um, we purposely kept 
what you get to when you click there, very simple. Um, because to differentiate from signing up for events, we just want people to think about and remember that there are things you can do right now on your own tonight and help. So it's just the classic, write a letter to the editor of your local paper or larger paper and um, host a gathering and, and get a, a discussion started. And I'll just say one uh, something about each one. With the writing a letter to the editor, we didn't create that idea. It's not rocket science. You don't need us to tell you you can write a letter to the editor. But a lot of people have that idea or think about doing it and don't do it. And one reason might be that it's um, a little intimidating. So we provided a guide when you click on that page um, on how to pull together an effective letter to the editor. And another reason people don't always do it is that you wonder if it really matters, if it makes any difference. And I just want to share that we have found from across the country from so many people that just reading a letter to the editor has made so many feel like other people are struggling with this. I wanna do something about it. Um, and they've gotten in contact with us or um, just kind of been moved um, to look further into it. So if you are writing something um, from your heart um, in your own words, and even if you don't have answers, if you're just saying, these are the questions that I'm struggling with right now, I, I want to rebuild our democracy. I want to, to build a better citizenship that all of us can start practicing. Um, I don't have the answers, but here are some ideas I have. Whatever you want to say, if, um, you know, we encourage you to, to write the letter, just write the letter. And you can also say, join Braver Angels if you have enough room in your word count. Um, and then the second thing on um, that page is um, to host a gathering. And again, this could be something really simple, informal that you just you know, pull a few friends or family members, um, club members, people on Facebook that you normally argue with. Um, in Zoom days, you can say, hey, jump on a Zoom call with me and let's discuss this stuff. You can kind of do it your way, but we're also going to get some helpful hints on the into the member portal about how to pull it together or some discussion questions, um, ways to format it. And you can also just reach out directly to me because that's something I can help you plan and kick off. Um, my email should be going in your chat box right now. It's juliebowler at braverangels.org. And helping you all get going in your Braver Angels experience is what I do. So I want you all, all 4,000 of you tonight to send me an email. <laughs> I, I, I can handle that load so um okay so that's i believe in you julie experience in act and over to april <laughs> i believe it this woman is a miracle guys she can answer <laughs> four thousand emails tomorrow um Excellent. So thank you. Lots of good questions are flowing into our Q&A box. And we only have a few minutes, but we'll take the ones that we can. And so I want to start with Gail Flynn. Gail, go ahead. Oh, and Gail, we can, if you unmute yourself, we can hear you. So just go ahead and, and speak your, your question. All right. Gail? We look forward to hearing from you. If you're having tech trouble, let's go first to Paul Thompson. So Paul, same instructions. I'm hitting ask to unmute for you, Paul. So you should be able to speak. All right, we're having some challenges. Um, Gail, back to you because it appears that you're unmuted. Okay, uh, while we figure this out, I'm gonna go ahead and, and read a couple of them. Um, so one of the questions that I'm seeing, uh, Paul, I believe your question, if you, um, 
yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and read your question, Paul. It is, how do we have conversations with elected officials? So how does that, how is that reflected in our action steps, Julie? How can people uh, go about that? Well, the, one thing you can do is just reach out to your own representatives. Um, it's, it's another thing that people think about doing and don't do, but it's so simple. If you go to senate.gov or house.gov and follow the links, you can find out, even if you don't know who your representative is, um, you, you'll get quickly to a contact page and you can call, email, write a letter. And that's another case where um, research has shown that that makes a difference. Uh, they do read your letters, they do read your emails and they wanna hear from you. Um, if, um, and I, I hope that answers it. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Um, and I'm going to go for slightly short uh, questions and answers just so we can get as many people as possible. Okay. In. Um, yeah. So, uh, Gail, we're going to give you one more try. Let me see if I can hear you. If not, I'm going to read your question. April, can you hear me? Gail, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, What's your question? <laughs> Yeah, my, um, my, my question, I'm, I'm attending this as a next door lead. Great. I'm not sure if you're familiar. Fabulous, what a great organization. Oh, great. Um, my, my question is, you know, I've, um, I've listened to both sides, wonderful, wonderful points. And from my perspective, I suppose, I try and do a lot of harmony, I obviously do a lot of moderating, but how would you, um, try to facilitate more love and respect for other neighbors, um, both by or far during these um, horrible times. <laughs> I'd like to get other people's perspective. It, it's a great question. It's sort of at the very heart of our work and your work. Um, we've developed some methods at, at Braver Angels that we think gets gets at that, gets at, the, gets at that result. Um, and I'd be happy to share them with you because the work that you're doing at next door, really using modern tools to bring people together at the local level is so good and feel such a kinship with what you're doing and would love to find some ways to work together. So maybe offline or we can find some ways just to share the methods that we have found to get people to to uh, to get this result, and then I'd love we'd love to learn more from you as well. Wonderful, I appreciate that so much. All right, thank you. Um, so next, we're going to go to a question that's from someone uh, whose Zoom name is Cancer Services. I'm guessing this is a work Zoom account. Um, go ahead, if if you're, yeah, okay. Yes. It looks like you're. Yes, great. Go for yes, it. Yes, sorry, work name. Um, so my question is about, is there kind of a good first question to open a conversation with somebody that you might not politically agree with for the goals of listening? Um, just kind of a first good opening question that might be safe, but draw some things out. Well, sure. I'm so happy because Bill Doherty, who really wrote the book for us on that question, is not on this panel. <laughs> I'm going to get the same what I would do. Uh, we often, Gail, in our, in our work, um, we often start with a question such as, um, tell me some of the experiences in your own life that have shaped your, your outlook on politics. What are some of the experiences? So get people to talk a little bit about themselves rather than their abstract philosophy. We found that that's really, really uh, a helpful way to get started. Excellent. Um, so I'm gonna take a second and answer a couple questions that have been asked over and over again in the Q&A box. And then we're gonna to, we're going to go to Susan Turner. Um, so I'm, I'm giving you plenty of warning and you can just make sure that you're off mute. Um, which I think you are, I think I can hear you. Um, so one of the questions that's been asked several times is, uh, are we a religious organization? Uh, obviously angels is in our title, so some people wonder. Um, the answer is no, we are, we're not a religious organization, we're a citizens organization. Um, however, we don't, we invite people to speak in whatever voice is most authentic to them. So many of our members choose to use religious language. Second, um, 
there, uh, a number of folks have asked a question that I think is one of the hardest ones for our democracy right now, which is what do we do uh, when we live in different fact universes, when it seems like people just like come to different conclusions because of course they did, <laughs> they had different starting points. And what I wanna say about this is we don't have answers on that, but um, we do have a debate on that at the end of the month. And as the, I should have said this earlier, but uh, my name is April Lawson and I'm the director of the debates program. And uh, our debate team has decided that that's what we wanna take on. So on January 28th, we will be addressing the question of uh, how do we handle that? Uh, can our democracy survive that? Do we have to have people having a shared sense of reality? How, how do we deal with this? Uh, and so I would invite you, if that's your question or your concern to, to sign up and join us. Everyone's hey, allowed to speak and ask questions. Yes, on, that, on that homepage with the three buttons, hit experience, and that's actually the first place you'll go. You can sign up for that debate. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Susan, go ahead. Wow. <laughs> I, I think my question was, how can we agree on what is true? Because the issue of truth seems to be underlying a lot of the disagreements question that one side believes is true, the other side doesn't believe is true. So how can you come together on such a fundamental question as truth? Absolutely. So there's our debate at the end of the month where we'll talk about that. But David, do you want to say a little more? There's no easy answer to this, as we know. But I do want to say one thing that I think goes to the very heart of why we're here tonight. People do not misunderstand, people do not disagree about facts because they're stupid, because they're ignorant, uh, because they're bullheaded. They disagree because of, we don't trust, this, because of who we trust. This is a social trust question. I believe certain things about whatever I believe because I trust the people who have told me. I, when you have a society where there's a fundamental breakdown of trust, in each other, in our institutions. People choose individually who they're gonna believe and who they're not gonna believe and there's no shared standard and that's why. So it's not that people have all of a sudden don't care about facts or they've drunk something that's made them stupid. It's that we have lost our ability to trust one another and we've lost our ability to trust any sources of information that are widely uh, shared. It's a great tragedy, and the only way to, re to recover that in the final analysis is not to call each other stupid or say, how come you don't understand the facts, but to rebuild the fundamentals of social trust. All right, next we will go to Kelly Nowak. Uh, Kelly, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much for hosting this evening. I'm, I'm finding it to be uh, very healing um, to be with so many people who are wanting to make positive changes. My question was, you know, how do we connect with others in our area? I live on the border of North Dakota, Minnesota, so I would be looking to possibly bring together a group from my surrounding area. I am a blue, I don't have any affiliations with any reds, so I would need assistance in making those connections. Sure. Lynn, Steve, call your office. Why don't you say something to this? Okay, person? I'm happy to jump in here. Uh, absolutely, we would love for you to entertain starting an alliance in your area. If you are interested, um, I would ask you to go to the Braver Angels website to look uh, and find a list of alliances. First, see if there's one near you. And then if there isn't, please contact uh, either myself or Steve Saltwick. My um, email is lhetty at braverangels.org and we will point you in the right direction and get you going. And if I could just say one thing uh, for the questioner, mm -hmm. for everybody that joins today, then the next day you're gonna get a letter from me and Lynn that will tell you how to find the state coordinator in your area. That is a pathway into finding local communities where you can have an expanded set of experiences here with Braver Angels. So really the simplest thing is if you join, then the very next day, you'll get more information about how to extend your experience with Braver Angels. 
All right, uh, we have time for one, probably one or two more. Um, Courtney, uh, Courtney Bud Karamiko. I might not be getting your name right, but go ahead. What's your question? Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Um, that that was perfect pronunciation. Um, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> wondering how you deal with um, what advice you have for people who sort of get um, harshly criticized um, for wanting to bridge the divide, just for wanting to talk to people on the side that that those people um, oppose. I, I think Mr. Ruff started to answer this question and I found his, his insight very comforting, but um, I am really struggling with this and getting very discouraged and I'd love to hear any thoughts you could share. Thank you. Yes, Reverend, do you wanna add something or? Or David Lapp, you wanna say, do you deal with- oh. <laughs> Reverend and then David. Uh, well, I, I would just say um, the first thing is is to with those people that are are being harsh, that to start and try and listen to them first. Uh, that's coming from somewhere. It, it's it's it, it there there's there's a reason for it, mm -hmm. and and listen more than speaking initially, and then just try and tell them. But I just I I, I want to. What I just done for you, I want to do for the other side as well, because um, it, like I said, it came down, it comes down to two words for me, humanity, those are human beings, and humility. Uh, and to just, but it starts with listening, because I think a lot of times that comes from people feeling as if they're not being heard. Mm. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll just add one thing here, which is uh, you are not alone in that. I think that everyone in this call is getting that right now. I know I'm getting it from my friends uh, from, from both directions. And um, we changed our name to Braver Angels uh, in basically March of last year. And this is why the word is braver, because it takes a lot to stand up for the work that we're doing right now. And, and the thing that it takes is courage. Yeah. And so I would just say, stand strong, know that we're with you. Uh, and it's particularly hard right now. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right, I think that is actually a great place for us to wrap up. I know that there are probably more questions, uh, but that's why we have Julie Bowler. Her email is juliebowler at braverangels.org. It's in the chat box. And I just would encourage you all to, to flood her with questions. Um, and yeah, so with that, we're going to move on to um, our to uh, our final thing of the evening, except for a song. So stay around for the song; it will be excellent. Um, and that is our checkout question. And so, I'd like you to write in the Q and A box an answer to the question: What are you going to do to hold America together? I'll give us thirty seconds to reflect on that. Um, but again, this can be something personal in your own life. It can be signed up to come to our debate or go to a workshop or it can be something with us or something with you or um, really anything that you feel your spirit moved to do. So 30 seconds just to reflect on that. What are you going to do to hold America together? All right, so once again, uh, I invite you to put your answer in the Q&A box uh, and we're gonna invite a few folks to tell us their answers too. So we're gonna start with Beth Mallow. Beth, what are you going to do to hold America together? I'm not sure we can hear you, Beth. Thanks everyone for being patient with the technical challenge. Oh, I think I got it now. Oh, there you go. Yay. Great. Yay. Um, 
So I've encouraged a lot of friends to join Braver Angels, but not all friends, you know, and I'm going to just try to be braver about saying to people, this is a really important organization. It may not seem like your cup of tea, but try it. That's what I'm going to do. Great. Thank you. Another example of courage. Um, Kevin O'Donnell, how about you? I um, woke up uh, and on the 6th and was pretty angry and whatnot and heard about Braver Angels actually through my wife, uh, looked into it and I am and feel like, so I'm in Wake Forest, North Carolina, feel like that our state is underrepresented as a purple state. We have a lot of conversation that needs to happen. Uh, so I'm going to try to initiate a local alliance and find like-minded people who are willing to start the conversation. All right, spectacular. North Carolina is one of our favorite states. Um, Dorothy uh, Bono, Bonu, how about you? All right, while we work on the unmuting there, we're gonna go to uh, Kimberly Harper. Hi, April. Hi, Kimberly. This is my first meeting and uh, Welcome. I actually only found out about it from a friend about an hour before. And oh, wow. Mm -hmm. didn't even know the organization existed. So the first thing I will do is let others know about the organization. It's been a very enlightening evening. And I personally need to work on my own humility. Hmm. Um, I've been angry. I've been in shock. I think those are normal responses based on what we saw, but I can't stay in that mode. It's time to move forward away from the anger and see how, I mean, I guess my greatest question is how do we hold folks accountable, but remain humble, curious, engaged, kind, considerate, loving, but that's my goal. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And welcome. We're glad Thank to have you. you. Thank you. Uh, Dorothy. Yes. Um, I'd love to start a community group. I used to run a hot debate club and uh, we'd have hey. people voicing uh, opposing visions and they were only allowed to repeat what the other person said and never attack. And it was incredible. It was incredible what happened. Uh, we kept people from walking out during the Iraq war of the school because they could have the debate. And wow. I, I look forward to doing that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, spectacular. Um, Toby, how about you? What are you gonna oh, do to hold America together? I had put in the Q and A um, self-examination and more braver angels meetings mm -hmm. because looking at that quote on the wall with malice towards none I do have malice inside me and I don't like that mm. and also I'm not brave so I'm hoping this will rub off on me <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no doubt it will um, Robin all right Robin I'm Hitting ask to unmute. So we'll come to you in a second. Uh, Patty Hagen. Hi, can you hear me, April? Yes, ma'am. Oh, good. Hi. Well, I, while we were talking, while y'all were talking, I went on and registered for the January 28th program. All right. It sounds wonderful. It's something that I really, I was talking with somebody with a different perspective than me when this all started unfolding last week. And he was going to go down, we live right outside DC. He was planning to go down to the march and decided it was gonna get violent, so he decided not to. And he was watching it while it was unfolding and didn't tell me. And I'm really, I need to work on that because I'm upset that he didn't tell me what was going on because I would have gotten off the phone. So I'm, I'm working on how to have a conversation with him, another friend, semi-relative, um, who think very, very different than me and believe, believe that the boat was stolen. Mm. And these mm -hmm. are both very intelligent people, once retired Air Force officer, 
it's like, where do I start? So I write the question about, tell me something about, you know, your view, what happened, your views about political politics growing up, whatever the question was. It, I've got, I wrote it down um, mm -hmm. to start the conversation because I think that's a good starting point. All right, so, wonderful. This has been very helpful. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Patty. Yeah. Um, let's go to Kathy Kint. Kathy? All right, I just hit hi. ask. Oh, there we go, good. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for hosting this. I've been a better uh, Braver Angels member for a couple of years. And I guess for me, it's listening for understanding with respect and good intention because we all have our story and our story gives us our perspective. And until we need to be listening to that and then we have a better understanding and we build that relationship and that's how we can create change. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Christy Krilinski. It's a wonderful name. What are you going to do to hold America together? Does that sound okay? I had a mouthful of salad. Yeah. <laughs> I love the honesty. Um, yes, Kathy. Excuse me, Christy. All right, we're working on muting there, unmuting rather. Let's go with um, Angela uh, Di Benedetto. Time for one or two more here. All right, Angela, we're gonna hit asking to unmute. In the meantime, let's go to Vince uh, Shoemaker. Good evening, thank you for all of this. Uh, I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Tomorrow morning, early Wednesday morning, I'll be with a Zoom group of a whole bunch of responsible, somewhat elderly, uh, but politically active gentlemen in a breakfast club that's been meeting since sometime in the 1930s. Uh, I'm going to invite them to at least inquire uh, of greater, a great, greater angels and see if I can't get a, a affiliate I'm gonna, started in I'm Grand gonna, Rapids. I'm gonna ask my question. Yes? Oh, hang on, sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, I, I just I just want this Beautiful. group of yes. <laughs> Sorry. Group of retirees mostly to start, uh, but maybe a debate group. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, I feel like we're uh, gonna have like just new groups springing up all over the country like flowers. So um, let's. I think we have time for about one more. So let's go to Peggy White. Peggy. Oh, <laughs> um, my, uh, my answer is just to try to find common ground. I live mm -hmm. in a small rural libertarian uh, community and very extremely divided. So that's the way I've tried to do it. My community and get involved in the town. And we try to find ways to uh, reach across, you know, reach across the borders with things we share. Wonderful. Yeah, it's the work in every town all over the country. Thank you. Um, I also just want to give a big thank you to the almost 1,000 people who put their answers in the Q&A box. Um, we uh, don't have the ability to respond to all of you, um, but we are grateful and uh, look forward to seeing what comes in the next few days and weeks ahead. And so now uh, we're going to end this evening with a song. And so I'd like to introduce you to Micah Hendler who is the founder and artistic director of the Jerusalem Youth Chorus, an Israeli-Palestinian music and dialogue project featured from The Late Show with Stephen Colbert to The New York Times. He's also a founding partner of Raise Your Voice Labs, a creative culture change company that helps organizations, companies, and communities transform their cultures and embody new visions for their future through deep group process work, collaborative songwriting, and music video production. Along with Alma Cook, who opened our gathering today, Micah is a co-leader of our music team here at River Angels, and he'll be bringing us home with America the Beautiful. And we'd love it if you sing along on mute in your homes. All right, Micah, take us home. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of gray. For purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain, America, America, God shed His grace on. 
Thank you, everyone, and good night.